It's layout, you know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, welcome. Welcome uh, here. My name is Gary Wilder. I'm the director of the Committee on Globalization and Social Change. And it is my pleasure to host this event where we get to discuss and celebrate Herman Bennett's new book, African Kings and Black Slaves, Sovereignty and Dispossession in the Early Modern Atlantic, by this book. Um, we have a distinguished group of commentators uh, um, for this discussion. So what I'm going to do is uh, introduce everyone now, say a little bit about uh, Herman and not much about the book, because we have three uh, distinguished commentators who are going to lead us in discussion, and then we'll open it up to um, a larger discussion with everyone here. So let me introduce, uh, moving from right to left, my right to left, uh, Sybil Fisher teaches at New York University, where she holds appointments in the departments of Spanish and Portuguese, the Department of History, and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. She's the author of Modernity Disavowed, Haiti and the Cultures of Slavery in the Age of Revolution, which received several book awards. And she's currently working on a book on Spanish-American independence, Simone Bolivar and the Place of Race and the Revolutionary Upheavals of the 19th Century. To her left is Christopher L. Brown, professor of history at Columbia University, who specializes in the history of 18th century Britain, the early modern British Empire, and the comparative history of slavery and abolition. He's the author of Moral Capital, Foundations of British Abolitionism, which won many prizes, and the editor of Arming Slaves from the Classical Era to the Modern Age. He's now at work on two projects, one on British experience along the West African coast in the era of the Atlantic slave trade, and a second on the decline and fall of the British planter class in the era of abolition and emancipation. And all the way to the left of Herman is uh, our colleague Mamadou Jouf, friend and colleague in New York, uh, who is currently the Leitner Family Professor of African Studies and History at Columbia University and a visiting professor at Sciences Po in Paris. His research focuses on African intellectual and urban histories and youth cultures. His more recent publications include the edited book, Tolerance, Democracy, and the Sufis in Senegal, and a number of co-edited volumes, including The Arts of Citizenship in Africa, and Rhythms of the Afro-Atlantic, and New Perspectives on Islam in Senegal. And uh, right in the middle is uh, our dear colleague, Herman Bennett, who, as we know, is professor in the PhD program in history here at the Graduate Center, uh, director of the CUNY Pipeline Program, which places underrepresented of students in graduate programs throughout the nation, as we know, I could read a long list, but anyone, everyone here knows how extraordinary Herman is. He's involved in so many initiatives throughout the building. He's a tireless teacher and mentor and colleague, and maybe most importantly, advocate. He advocates for programs, he advocates for people, he advocates for friends and allies. He has been centrally involved in IRIDAC, the Institute for Research on the African Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean. He co-directed a multi-year Mellon Sawyer seminar on the cultures and histories of freedom, which he brought to the CUNY Grad Center and uh, was the source of many exciting events and conversations. He's, of course, also a core member of the Committee on Globalization and Social Change and has done a great deal of work to make institutional connections between the Graduate Center and African universities. So um, anecdotally, soon after I arrived at the Graduate Center, I got to know Herman in two of the memorable intellectual spaces that he brought into being, the Atlantic History Seminar and the Caribbean Epistemology Seminar. And it was during an early session, uh, I think it was Kazanjian. Kazanjian was presenting, I think that's the first time I met you uh, and met him, but it was really at the end of that session as we were walking to dinner that I realized that the Graduate Center really was and would be as intellectually exciting as I'd hope, as I'd hope, as I hoped it would be when I made the leap to come here, and that was largely uh, through your doing. So you were really a kind of gateway and in introduction to how what the Graduate Center could be. 
And I made so many enduring connections in and beyond the Graduate Center through those two seminars, those two groups. And that's really the spirit, that spirit of transdisciplinary collective inquiry uh, about big pressing issues that I've tried to carry forward in the Committee on Globalization and Social Change. We are so lucky that Herman has been an indispensable member of the committee. Personally, I've learned so much from being in dialogue with him most Tuesday mornings for the past many years. Uh, and of course, Herman is not only skilled at making magic in the building here. He's a distinguished and accomplished scholar, a scholar of the early modern African diaspora and its formative role in the making of what we now call the West. Uh, he really dazzles. He works across languages and regions and fields, uh, regularly linking research in Europe, Latin America, and Africa. In addition to African kings and black slaves, this new book we're going to talk about today. He's the author of many articles and pieces, but two uh, important previous books, Colonial Blackness, A History of Afro-Mexico, uh, and Africans in Colonial Mexico, Absolutism, Christianity, and Afro-Creole Consciousness. So let me just say a couple of words about uh, this book, African Kings and Black Slaves, and this kind of intervention before our distinguished uh, speakers uh, lead us into the book in much more detail. Uh, it's a short, dense, ambitious book. Uh, I say short in the, in the most admiring sense. It's just really a rich, dense uh, book that requires attention. Uh, it's a strong intervention into European and African history, into black studies, into post-colonial studies. It attempts to unthink so many of the anachronistic assumptions that continue to inform discussions about Europe's encounter with Africa and the transatlantic slave trade. Namely, that enslaved Af Africans were objects of exchange and that the Europeans that encountered them were secular, modern, instrumental proto-capitalists. Herman insists that we return to that moment of encounter and entanglement before, and I love this formulation early in the book, where he says, before Europe became the West, right? This important uh, moment of, of, uh, of heterogeneity, to recognize that these Africans were embedded in particular political formations and political traditions with their own specific conceptions of sovereignty and political subjectivity and authority and hierarchy and that the Europeans they encountered were early modern, were Iberian, were Catholic, with corresponding notions of sovereignty, subjectivity, and authority. Uh, that conventional, so part of the framing here is that conventional scholarship uh, doesn't only miss the historical specificity of these two sets of actors, but in missing that historical specificity, misses the opportunity to understand in a deep, deeper and more nuanced way the role that these Africans really had in shaping and constituting European political modernity. So this is a bold and important work of decentering and rethinking. It's the kind of work that I think can only be done uh, after a lot of other work, after years and years of grappling with these places and these materials and these narratives and the scholarly debates. It's the kind of empirically rich, theoretically informed, and politically explicit history that so many of us try to encourage our students to do. So thank you, Herman, for this book. And thank you to Chris and Mamadou and Sybil uh, for taking the time to uh, think with us, uh, to think with Herman. Uh, about these important issues. So, um, yeah, I'll pass it over to you guys. Which order? You can work that out. All right, I'll go first. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Center for Globalization and uh, Social Change for the invitation to uh, participate in this panel on Herman Bennett's fabulous new book. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and, uh, and a great honor. Um, I'm, I've come down with a terrible cold, so I'm going to speak softly and I hope you bear, you bear with me um, uh, through this. Um, so I should say I've uh, enjoyed reading the book enormously in part because it's uh, very unusual to read a historian with all interdisciplinary inclinations we all entertain, but to read a historian who so deeply engages narrative 
and text. Um, I myself uh, am a literary scholar by training, although I'm also an interloper in history. Um, but it's, it's indeed very rare to see a book that um, uh, engages um, ideological and narrative traditions, if not fictional traditions. We're talking about a time when this concept doesn't, didn't even exist, um, but engages so deeply. So I'll just, since I'm the first, I'll do, add a little bit to the summary that uh, Gary already started, um, and then raise some questions that I found fascinating and that uh, were brought to my mind by in the process of reading. So African kings and black slaves is an inquiry into uh, a neglected history of, European, of the European encounter with Africa, specifically the encounter between Spanish and Portuguese traders and African kings, roughly between 1440 and 1560, as mediated by and commented upon by contemporary actors, theologians, and political philosophers. As such, it is less about Africa and specific African actors than it is about Europe and the complexities uh, of the interactions between late medieval and early modern Europeans and Africans. It introduces much needed nuance and detail into a story that all too often has been flattened out into the story of how African savages were turned into black slaves and how Africa came to represent the quintessential other. African kings and slaves is, in this sense, a genealogical inquiry into history that, Bennett argues, is buried under the sedimentations of theoretical and historical narratives driven by 18th and 19th century concerns to such a degree that we can no longer recognize the central features of this encounter, most importantly, its political nature. African kings and slaves shows how and why it is that this history has become unrecognizable and how this misrecognition that he traces, tracks through the, the, the body of texts affects the way in which we, to this day, think the African diaspora. I have to admit that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a daunting uh, task to do justice to the complexity and erudition of the arguments uh, in African kings and black slaves. Um, Bennett situates his argument by reviewing and critiquing vast amounts of scholarship on, the Afri on African slavery and the slave trade, works by cultural critics, not just historians, uh, works in late medieval and early modern political philosophy, and, as if this wasn't enough, and the annals of legal history. Alongside this critical work, there are, as a kind of a counterpoint of sorts, intriguing, intriguing re-readings of Spanish and Portuguese chronicles, papal bulls, and the work of late medieval philosophy. Uh, and this is not, it's not organized chapter by chapter where one chapter does one thing, another chapter does another thing, but it's thematically organized around notions such as you know, trade or um, ceremony or, or ritual or uh, and so on, and goes back and forth between the the, lo the long durée argument that starts in the early, late medieval period and takes us to the present, and then the short period of 100 years that keeps coming back as a counterpoint to the narratives that we are familiar with. Um, alongside this critical work, there are, um, oh, I have done this. <laughs> so we have, the book moves constantly uh, back and forth between these two timelines. On the one hand, the 100 years, and then the long uh, story of uh, readings and misreadings and interpretations and misinterpretations. Um, Bennett's descriptions of the first encounters in, between Europeans and Africans are absolutely fascinating. I'm not an early modernist, so I don't have that much to say to it, but I have to say that I highly recommend that you read it. Um, he shows that the encounters between African kings were ruled by ritual, ceremony, and diplomacy, and did not differ significantly from encounters with European or between European rulers. Uh, I'm sure early modern historians uh, will have a lot more to say about this. Um, but for the purpose of our conversation here, I'd like to focus on um, two issues that I found particularly in intriguing. Um, one is, I wonder what, it, what the analysis that, that um, uh, Herman puts forward means for understanding of African diasporic identity. There, there are a few um, sort of hints throughout the book uh, about what this, this meaning might be, but I would just love to hear more about it if we, if we get a chance to talk about it. Um, 
so if one of the terms or some of the terms that I found that speak to this issue um, are shared consciousness, culture, racial ancestry, the unified homogenous black subject, the slave trade as black man's burden. So these are all concepts that I think Herman wants to complicate and question by restoring this early modern, late medieval, early modern history that we can no longer recognize or read in the, in the annals because of the actions of what, what Herman calls late modernity, um, meaning 18th and 19th century. Um, yeah, that's, that's the early modern speaking, right? Um, so that, that would be one question I would really um, like to, to um, just converse about. The other question I had concerns the very notion of the political in this book. Um, so I'm, I'm intrigued and persuaded by uh, the insistence on reclaiming the political as a category relevant to the history of slavery and the slave trade. And that's in part of my, because of my own work where uh, when I studied the um, uh, Spanish-Caribbean reactions to the Haitian Revolution, I found that the operations of denial and, and disavowal really were not a sort of broad rejections of a, of a general sort or denials of acts that you know, supposedly didn't happen, but it was a denial of the political nature of the Haitian Revolution. So it was a, you know, very, a much more specific kind of um, operation that I saw, and I thought it was a denial implied in this disavowal of the political nature of the Haitian Revolution implied is also a denial of the political nature, of oper you know, operational um, capacity of, of slaves and, and those enslaved. Um, so I had some questions about that, or I don't know. Um, so on the one hand, um, the political, the way the political operates in this book is as a descriptive category that captures what was constitutive in Europe's engagement with African sovereigns. Um, and on the other hand, there is a notion of the political as a kind of a metacritical concept that relates to the categories or the vocabularies that we use in our uh, analysis. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, these are two different meanings, and I'm also not completely sure whether they are in s perhaps in some ways related in ways that I haven't, haven't quite grasped. So to explain this a little more, so um, Herman shows, for instance, that Spanish and Portuguese chroniclers and political actors related politically to African sovereigns and made distinctions between sovereign and non-sovereign Africans. When they single out the latter for legitimate enslavement, they implicitly recognize African sovereignty. That's a political act uh, that becomes obscured under the hegemony of 18th and 19th century thought about slavery. So when early modern historians, and I believe we are now talking about our contemporaries, so those who work on early modern history, when early modern historians fuse slavery, trade, and the economy, they follow the 17th and 18th century theories of English, French, and Italian provenance. Spanish theologians and philosophers like Francisco de Vitoria, de Soto, de Mercado saw it differently and fused slavery, dominion, uh, sovereignty, and polis. So here you can see the, the argument, right? Um, so along with that, we have the erasure of Africa and Iberia. But then there's the other side, um, where the book engages the historiography of slavery. On, and so the question I had is, there's another way in which the political is demoted, if not erased. So when US historians like Genovese or Berlin or Morgan argue that American slavery was driven by economic forces rather than primordial racism, and that racism emerges as a way of managing and controlling social relations in a slaveholding society, thus affect the history of slavery to economic history, the political is evacuated in a different way. Uh, and arguably, this is a matter of historical method. So I'm just curious about um, your position vis-a-vis -vis the Marxist argument. Um, and I, I'm linking this to a fascinating moment in the book when you invoke the Marxist notion of primitive accumulation. Um, so perhaps the political is, per, perhaps we could make a connection between these two notions of political through that notion in Marx, but I, I'd love to hear more about it. Um, 
So, um, that, that was the, the, my, my biggest point. Another question I had is related to this, and it has to do with the role of property. Um, so I was thinking whether understanding slavery in relation to property is indeed an erasure of the political. Because when you think about early modern political theories, hey, look, um, clearly liberty, eminently political notion, is under understood through the um, uh, concept of property. So I don't know quite what to do with that, but um, I thought maybe the opposition between the political and the economic um, you know, could be interrogated uh, somewhat in, the, in, this, in this respect. So um, I, have, I have more questions, but I think I'll leave it at this. So thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. So what a treat this is to uh, celebrate a new book um, by my very uh, dear friend um, and one of my uh, very favorite historians. Uh, I kind of titled this for myself, um, some preliminary and undigested thoughts uh, on African kings and black slaves. And I was glad that uh, Gary emphasized the um, ambition and the density of this work. Uh, this is one of those books that you're gonna come back to over and over and over again. Um, it's not the kind of book that you sit down one reading and go, okay, I got it. Um, it is so rich in terms of the ideas, the intervention, um, of the critique, um, of the empirical work. There's a lot to wrestle with. So I have some things to say, but I reserve the right to change my mind as I... <laughs> As I, as I think about it a little bit more. Um, some here will know that Herman Bennett and I taught together uh, in the Department of History at Rutgers in New Brunswick many years ago. Uh, the practice there is to teach very large lecture classes. I don't think you do that here, do you? No, I don't think so. Um, it was pretty much required, everybody did it. Uh, and the staples there are surveys of European um, and American history. Neither of us wanted to do that, though, so we moved into what were essentially international um, and world history courses. I developed something I called slavery and world history. Herman took over the age of European expansion class that had been taught there for many years, a sweeping survey that went from the late 14th century um, down to the end of World War II, although I think sometimes you brought it to the 60s and 70s, maybe up to the present day. His range then astonished me. Um, it still astonishes me. He has this remarkable capacity to toggle between uh, the specifics, the minutia of uh, kinship records in 17th century Mexico, um, and then move um, in a blink of an eye to the broadest themes and problems at the intersection of colonialism and the history of the African diaspora. In that course on the age of European expansion, in each term, he pulled off this extraordinary balancing act uh, between teaching the narrative and undermining it, sometimes within the same minute, within the same <laughs> sentence. Um, it was really an extraordinary experience um, for the undergraduates. I thought about that course often over the last few days as I've read and reflected um, on this wonderful new book that we've gathered to discuss. African kings and black slaves manages characteristically to trouble two different master narratives, one about the African diaspora, the other about Europe in the age of discovery and colonization. It's a brave book uh, and also a necessary one. For historians of both subjects, despite their many differences, have in a way conspired to neglect, avoid, skip the first century of European history in Atlantic Africa, its foundational moment. And the choice is understandable. The whole coast seems to be an exception to the history of European imperialism in those opening generations, opening centuries. 
And faced with the need to reconceive the subject of European imperialism when you look at what the actual specifics are of the European experience in Africa, the prevailing choices have been simply to align it all together, to leave the subject. Can't fit it into the way we think about colonialism and imperialism, so we're just not going to deal with it. What happens, though, if we treat the 15th and 16th centuries as foundational rather than exceptional? On the European side, it becomes a history of expansion without conquest and enterprise without empire. On the African side, we would have to dispatch with the teleologies built into the notion of pre-colonial. If it's not clear what we should call this period, is it late medieval Africa, is it early modern Africa? I think you can see the problems with pre-colonial. We don't have a right, what the right term is for this time period. African kings and black slaves makes clear what that subject is and what it is not. It's a history of politics, diplomacy, state, uh, statecraft, a history which on the European side, the Catholic Church matters far more than capitalism. The politics of Atlantic Africa in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries were nothing like the Ottoman Empire, but in setting limits upon European expansion and dictating in terms to European monarchs and merchants, the intercultural dynamics look more like the patterns in the Eastern Mediterranean than what occurred in the Americas, or at least in Central America and the Caribbean. To what Europe does this history of the Atlantic slave trade belong? African kings and black slaves reminds us that it was the Europe of the Reconquista, long before the Enlightenment, long before Protestantism, long before capitalism, and indeed before Renaissance humanism. It's a Portuguese story rather than a Spanish one. One main reason um, why I think the subject has not been wrestled with more seriously. If this was a Spanish story or a British story, undoubtedly, at least in the North American Academy, we would have heard a lot more about it. Of course, historians of Portugal and Brazil know a good bit of this story. And I think one of the questions is, is what does the work offer to those who already are familiar, um, have some familiarity with this 15th and 16th century materials, those who've been in those sources? Um, that part of the in intervention is not entirely clear to me yet. And maybe we can discuss that at some point. But in any case, one of the more surprising features of Bennett's research is just how unsurprising Atlantic Africa seemed to be to Portuguese explorers. Herman calls attention to the absence of wonder. He highlights how easy it was for European visitors to accommodate their discoveries to what they thought they already knew about Africa and Africans. This is not the tradition-bound, slow-to-react humanist of Renaissance Spain that John Eliot told us about many years ago in the old world and the new, but instead an old world and perhaps an even older world rediscovering each other or perhaps encountering each other uh, anew on very different terrain. Geographic discoveries in this telling do not seem to be ethnographic ones, at least in the way that we would expect from the literature on European voyages in the Americas. Now, it'd be good to know where the Trans-Saharan trades fit into this story. Those surely gave the Portuguese visitors um, important ideas of what they um, could expect to find as they moved south along the coast. But in any case, what we have here is a West Africa as an extension of an older Mediterranean world, at least from a Portuguese point of view, rather than an anticipation of an Atlantic one. Two other thoughts as a first reaction to this provocative book. One concerns what the late Ira Berlin might have called time and space in the history of the Atlantic slave trade. As things stand, change across space draws more attention than change over time in the scholarly literature. This is in part a function of the emphasis on culture in the history of the African diaspora, in which the question of who came from where is paramount. Herman's very good at thinking of through some of these issues about culture and the way it figures has come to predominate um, in the history of the African diaspora. I'm not going to uh, deal with that issue at this, but at, at this moment, but that's something we, I'm sure we'll discuss. But to my mind, there's a lot more to work to do at more intermediate and micro conceptions of space than the cultural emphasis encourages. But change over time figures even more rarely in our scholarship. As Herman emphasizes, and this point needs to be taken very seriously, the 18th century has come to stand in for the whole. And on nearly every aspect of the Atlantic slave trade, the British traffic has been taken as representative of the rest. 
at least for Anglophone scholars. The British traffic um, said that. Now, this makes sense. This is where the most abundant and most accessible resources reside, at least for Anglophone scholars. It's the era that the abolitionists who produced the first archive for the study of the slave trade knew best and examined most. But the disproportionate focus on that traffic in those years distorts the history in crucial ways and obscures all kinds of differences from one era to the next, differences that deserve far more attention than they've received. Even in the 18th century, the Atlantic slave trade of 1777 was not quite the same trade as the trade of 1737, and in ways that mattered at the time. It was even more distinct in 1637 and 1537. Those of us who teach the subject know this, but we also invoke the 400-year time span to convey the immensity of the subject. But the effect of doing that, of such declarations, and I say this from my own experience trying to teach this subject, can be to convey a sense of timelessness in this history that went on for 400 years. It was always happening all the time, everywhere, forever and ever, rather than the specifics of the right nowness, to put it crudely. By taking us to the initial moments of encounter and then lingering on them and staying with them, he invites us to consider the formative era of what we've come to know as the Atlantic slave trade in its specifics. Time and space then. Finally, um, one last thought, politics. Those of us interested in this subject, in this broad subject of the Atlantic slave trade, the diaspora, colonialism, European experience in Africa, really need to follow Herman's lead here um, in taking the broad rubric of politics more seriously. The institutional arrangements that emerged from the early decades of cross-cultural relations in Atlantic Africa had a very long tail, deep into the 18th century and in some instances beyond. It is in fact the story um, for much of, at least on the coast, for much of the uh, era, the long era of the Atlantic slave trade. Many of the elements he highlights in what he calls the ceremonies of encounter proved to be a persistent feature of African-European relations. Political theater, in his words, including rites and rituals, diplomacy and laws, statecraft, these, he says correctly, have been studiously ignored. The re remarkably durable practices proved remarkably effective. The history of the Atlantic slave trade is the story of violence from beginning to end, of course. Brutal, inhumane, both at the level of system, but also in terms of interpersonally, from between one person and another. Yet it never could have worked, it seems to me, and I really take this from his book, it never could have worked without the peace that prevailed between African and European elites who conducted it. Trade flourished, he writes, in a stable context, imagined and real, in which local sovereigns could, on the basis of their legitimacy, protect the new arrivals from Europe. And this is my question for you. Is there anywhere else in the long history of European expansion that you know so well where Europeans engaged in fewer fights with the local population or with each other, all the places that they visited? I hate to say this, but although I think it's true, but the vast scale of the Atlantic slave trade, the numbers that we've become so familiar with, represents a political and administrative achievement in Atlantic Africa of the highest order. The political and diplomatic work which made that possible deserves our attention indeed. Thank you. I would like to thank Herman and Gary for inviting me to be part of this discussion about a book which is a very, very important book, which is raising critical question for us. After I finished reading it, I began asking myself one simple question. What am I doing? Am I an Africanist, <laughs> a historian of Africa, a historian of the Atlantic, 
a historian of connected histories. And I think one aspect of this book is precisely that. What Herman is doing is connecting different histories, is connecting different communities in contact. And the idea of the contact and what the contact is generating is critical. But we still have a problem. The problem is who is actually documenting the contact. It's true that the basis of these books are the Spanish and Portuguese chronicle. And Herman is doing very well in trying to excavate from those texts what, how Africans are. And, and I think it's where your discussion of the politic and re-injecting the politics in this early period is interesting because you are understanding the politics outside what uh, this territory you are excluding from your investigation. It's a pre-modern medieval politics is why you are actually insisting on, on ceremonies, on the rhetoric and performance of lordship. And it seems to me that what you are documenting is a space in which African kings, the African elite is able to engage with traders, with missionaries, not in the term of the Europeans, but in the term of the Africans. And the Europeans are able to engage in this debate precisely because the references seem to so close. The pump, the, you know, the, 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 the kind of ceremonials, but also the legal regime and ways in which power and institutions are understood. It is it's basically a kind of very early modern period in which, and you show it quite clearly, the West is not yet produced. But what is interesting, uh, when I finish reading your book, what I was thinking is actually a West existed but different from the 18th, 19th century West. It's the West which was produced by the engagement between Africans and the Portuguese. It's a moment where Africa is part of the West. And the language which is used precisely to open up that space is a language which are shared by Africans and and European. So, so, so for me, your book is allowing us to have that conversation, to try to figure out, yeah, the library based on which resources are available, both for Europeans, but also for Africans. And it's probably why during this period, actually, Africans are quote, unquote, agents. They are able to impose that because they have, first, they have the power. Second, they are the one defining the kind of resources which are going to be exchanged. And it's where also it could be very interesting to, to, to try to figure out how the notion of slave and the cultures attached, associated to the status of, of slavery are, are important. So for me, the first twist, which is the important twist, is, is precisely that, is the way in which by you know, firmly deciding that the site of encounter is a site of theory, is a site where you know, an idea of the politics could be constructed is an important element. The second aspect which shows, you know, I think that, that you are a very, very good historian is your reading of the archives. And your reading of the archives to actually, this is, uh, I think, very, very important, 
to, to identify the ethnography. I was much more interested in how you excavate an ethnographic dimension through written text and texts which were completely uh, invested in you know, locating commodities, in trades, but also in producing a representation of Africans. And how this reciprocal engagement allowed the two actors to be able to, 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 to inform, I think, their, their, their engagement. The third element which seems to me important is about the Atlantic. And I was asking myself, what is the Atlantic in this book? Like when you say African, African kings, I was saying, OK, what is an African king? I know what is a black slave. I think it's easier. But what is an African king is very problematic. Even the notion of African is problematic. You yourself say, you know, some, the, the, the kind of typology, the epistemology of the Atlantic is an 18th, 19th century epistemology. And probably, be, and I know that you know that and as a, as a historian of the African diaspora, the idea of Africa is actually a diasporic idea. Africans don't have an idea of being African. African became African thanks to African Americans. Without African Americans, they are completely unable to think of themselves as African. And it's why it's interesting to try to play the game of what is an African king, except by inventing the African king. The African king has an invention of white traders and missionaries. And this is also part of what you say why the discussion was, was, was possible. Because the space and the temporalities that inform the kind of formation of both the West, the people who are coming. Because Africans, again, are building, you know, the white men they are encountering has the others, the people of the sea, when they are actually defining themselves as the people of the land. And it's the tension between the people of the sea and the people of the land they are trying to actually, they, they, they are trying to, to elaborate, they are trying to conceive. So based on those freak, I read your book, and I began asking myself questions based on those two moves, I think, that are the important moves. And I think that the fact that you showed quite clearly that we have to move out of a perimeter where we have been comfortable. The 18th and 20th century is critical. If you want to understand the formation of the West, the European West, Africa and its relation to the West, but also the African diaspora, and the way in which each of these free entities are still engaged in imagining the others. The, the, the idea of the imagining of the other is important. And it's also something, in particular, when you discuss slave culture, you do an excellent job. But I think also there it's possible to go beyond. Because the idea of, of slavery and slave culture is also contested. You, you, you know, I, I remember vaguely paper I read a long time ago by Toni Morrison. It's a very short paper, which is titled Home, where she's saying 
that the legacy of slave of, of, of slavery, but also the legacy of race is so important that we cannot drop race. We have to keep it without racism, as she say. And this is also, I think, an, an, an important discussion about, in particular, your extraordinary discussion, I think, of John Thornton, you, you, you know, and the impact of Africa in, and the Africans in the making of, 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 of the Atlantic world. And this is about your discussion about, about the nature of the, mm -hmm. of, the, of the colonial library. Of course, here we have a problem. The first problem is qualifying the library as colonial. Right. And in the case of Africa, you know, uh, excluding of the libraries. I think it's not only the Arab, Arabic library, right. but also, also the African American library, right. which has played, which has played a critical role. And you know, uh, the literature on the Islamization of Africa is showing more and more that probably the racialization of relation in the Sahara and Sahel could be an influence of this early period which changes also the way in which we understand today, we understand today slavery. And it's also about who is producing the colonial library. Is it produced by the European or as Gurab Desai said, is it a co-production? And the idea of the, the library being co-produced is important. Is it a process where things are, are autonomous? And this is also your of a great contribution, showing the basis on which these different historiographies has been produced, and, and showing in particular that uh, Fonton's book, but also Sweet's book, is about Africa. It's not about the African diaspora. It's about the African past. And the, those tensions are important to understand you know, the perspective based on which we are producing our interpretation, which again shows that history is still including for us the science of identity or identification, that, that, that history is a science for a cause. Like I think your book is critical because it's for a cause. The way in which in particular you use, you know, black radical intellectuals in re-questioning, you know, race, re-questioning identity, re-questioning politics. In particular, one turn when you use uh, you were talking about that, uh, you know, Frederick Robinson showing that, uh, you know, feudalism could create what he called a, a racial capitalism has, has a consequence. Actually, by using this medieval library, which has played such a critical role in the encounter, you can show exactly the consequences, the impact of that. And, and, and I think it's, it's an important. Another element, very quickly, which I thought it was a very, very, very interesting element is, is, is your discussion is your discussion about culture. And what I was thinking, because you don't use it in this book, is uh, the book by Simon G. Candy. Mm -hmm. Because it's questioned your discussion about, about, uh, 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 about slave culture and about the construction of both slavery and a kind of understanding of culture before the enlightenment. How, how does it function? And, and how the two are associated or, 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 or are associated or, 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 or dissociated. And, and based on that, as I say in my uh, earlier, I began asking myself, 
the issue of a field, when we talk about Africa, when we talk about the encounter, because I'm, I am supposedly an African, and the kind of epistemological and uh, theoretical uh, spaces we should claim. Are we Africanist? Are we Atlanticist? I know that uh, my colleague is usually presented as an Atlantist. I don't present myself that way. <laughs> <laughs> and now we talk a lot about world history, about connected history. But my interest, and is what you are trying here, is to measure the African presence and the impact of the African presence. And you are, I think you are, you are allowing us, you are allowing us to do, and your, 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 your discussion is echoed very nicely by the literature, uh, you know, by the Africanist literature. When I read your paper, your book, I was already comparing. And next year I will teach it comparing with my colleagues who have worked in particular on Angola. And what showed quite clearly not only the recognition of the African sovereignty by the Portuguese, but a diplomatic engagement you have shown which has been the defining terms of uh, the, the encounter. So thank you very much for a great book. Sure. Yeah. Whatever you want. <laughs> um, Gary just made the mistake of saying, do whatever you want. <laughs> That's not, you know, I'm not the guy you want to say that to. <laughs> First of all, I want to, um, I want to thank um, the, the commentators. I'm going to try to respond um, to do due diligence to, to these um, really challenging um, comments. I want to but before I do that, I want to just, I would like to thank um, um, Gary Wilder and uh, Lindsay Lee, and, among others, for all the work that they did to make this possible. 